Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com here. It's now Wednesday, the 9th of August, 2023, and I have for you today what I consider to be a very interesting update, so I hope you'll stick around and check it out. Yes, the title is Long Live Dora, but we're going to look at some other interesting things after we talk about this exceptional hurricane that actually got its start as a tropical wave, one of these easterly waves of energy and low pressure that developed over Africa way back in July. Remember July? It seems like it was just yesterday, right? Well, for Dora, it has been quite the journey all the way from, I mean, maybe even the Ethiopian highlands, across Africa through the Sahel region, into the Atlantic where it became Invest Area 95L, tried to make something of itself, and then it did just that in the Pacific with this very long journey, and it is still going. So we're going to talk about that. I'm going to show you some really interesting things about it. And then we're going to look at what's coming potentially for the Atlantic Basin. The signs are starting to become a little bit clearer that within the next week to 10 days, I think we're going to start to see a flip, and then things are going to change pretty rapidly as we approach the end of the month. So yeah, interesting update today. Let's get started. First of all, Really neat little animation here, satellite animation from our friends at Fox Weather. Hurricane Dora remaining a Category 4 storm for four straight days, really racking up the ace points. But, you know, like, do the ace points get shared from the East Pacific to the Central Pacific? And if it makes it into the Western Pacific and gets renamed as a typhoon, how does all that work? Pretty interesting stuff there. 4,000 miles so far, give or take in the Pacific alone. But, like I said, it got its start in the Atlantic Basin. After moving off the coast of Africa, it triggered the yellow crayon, as a lot of people like to call it. National Hurricane Center first outlook on what would become Dora way back on July 19th. You remember that? We were like, oh, here we go. The Atlantic's going to wake up. It's going to be a very busy time of it, potentially. But what we didn't really realize, I think, was all the dry air that was sitting out here, the stable atmosphere. So the structure of uh, what became Dora was there. And as we just move through this, let's just go, oh, we don't want latest available, we want later. I think I've messed this up. Hold on, let's just go back, see if I can fix this, if it'll let me. Yay. All right. So there's Dora on the first outlook back on the 19th. And then let's just go through this and see how it evolved. Pretty cool that you can do this at the Hurricane Center site. Um, eventually, let's see when they designated this as an invest. Yep, 95L was classified, if you will, on July 21st. That's Friday. I was in Death Valley, uh, 123 degrees out there at the time, but that's a story for another day. Let's just move this on. It became uh, looking like a high potential of development. Different models were really suggesting that this could go, had pretty good consensus but the atmosphere and the environment overall were too stable so 95L really didn't have a chance to do much and moved on towards the Caribbean Sea we had other development that tried to uh, come up as well and then there's another one that came off of Africa and then it looked like just nothing would happen with it so let's move over to the East Pack where it first was mentioned on Wednesday July 26 the tropical wave energy from X95L future Dora was sitting over here so the National Hurricane Center was talking about that on the eastern Pacific side of things and you can see how this evolved over time finally it went from yellow to orange meaning, uh, meaning medium chance of development and then it got the little X there as the energy associated with Dora what would eventually be Dora X95L see it's a lot to keep up with was pretty close to Central America and you can see that just a little bit here on the graphical tropical weather outlook product from the National Hurricane Center. If we just move this through, this is every 48 hours that this outlook goes to or through, there it emerged into the Eastern Pacific and at that point high probability of development and we had 5E, E for Eastern Pacific and voila! Ah, can you believe it? On August 1st, it was born. Nine days later, we got this animation from Fox Weather that I just showed you. This is what it looks like on the wind swath map. It got its start way over here, just off the coast of Mexico. 
and then it moved southwest the entire time as strengthening high pressure developed to the north and you got to remember that these steering mechanisms these high pressure areas are a lot like this is the way I like to visualize it like a balloon that's being inflated so it gets bigger and it just kind of moves everything else around it especially these more buoyant if you will areas of low pressure high pressure is usually denser air low pressure is lighter air it's usually rising simple physics and meteorology there so the high pressure probably expanded and it might have moved a little bit but everything in the atmosphere is generally a fluid and so it just moved on the southern periphery of that high keeping it well to the south of Hawaii so we didn't have to worry about any direct impacts there although we are seeing some devastating fires in Maui today not directly at all related to Dora maybe some of the subsidence and sinking air that might be a stretch but no Dora was not a direct threat to Hawaii at any point in time because of that very strong high to the north that kept it moving westward and then eventually west southwestward and it uh, I think it was 140 degrees longitude if I'm if I'm wrong about that my apologies but once it moved west of there it became the responsibility of the Central Pacific Hurricane Center and once it crosses the international date line which is 180 longitude it'll get called a typhoon if it stays at 74 miles per hour or higher hurricanes typhoons cyclones generally the same thing just like we have different names around the world for dogs right canine is the scientific name tropical cyclone here for these systems we call them hurricanes in the eastern pacific in the west pack they get renamed as typhoons look at it it is a marvel to watch the long-lived life here of dora again racking up the ace points not bothering anybody probably very little shipping activity across this vast area of the Pacific. There's some out there, certainly. Um, but really cool to look at from space, kind of study it, see what a uh, well-developed, long-lived, mature hurricane looks like without direct impacts to people, marine life and whatnot that's out there. You know, they deal with it however they deal with it, right? Uh, not a very large hurricane, pretty compact overall, and that has helped to insulate it from the more stable environment that is around you got that colder water that is uh, sort of coming in from the northeast to southwest down here that I'll show you that in a minute believe me uh, but it, it it was able to overcome all of that very interesting that uh, Dora has done what it has done very similar to Dora in 1999 by the way we had another one named Dora that took a very similar track back in 99 for what it's worth all right so will Dora make it crossing the dateline there's the dateline right there 180 uh, international dateline we'll draw a yellow line right up here as best I can it's like kindergarten right trying to draw and keep within the lines so let's see what the GFS shows here nice moisture envelope with it look at all the dry air though to the north that relative humidity like five to twenty percent at best but Dora is small enough that it's able to just take advantage of the latent heat at the surface of the Pacific Ocean and it has maintained itself all that time oh that's gonna be close 989 millibars crossing the dateline it's like trying to get the football across the end zone line right there right into the into the end zone you know all you gotta do I guess in football you just have to break it just a little bit the plane break the plane with the ball as they say right so we'll see we'll check back and see how Dora is doing tomorrow all right now to current stuff very interesting things I see forces in motion uh, the players on the field so to speak starting to really line up and as we get towards the end of the month I think we're gonna have a really big switch and we're gonna be talking a lot more about interesting things happening in the Atlantic Basin the Pacific's probably gonna stay active as well but it's not gonna be long that the curtain will go up on the Atlantic side and we had all better be very very prepared mentally we need to wrap our brain around it accept the fact that yes we could be dealing with some hurricanes don't just hope it away that's not a good planning tool at all uh, you know, try to stay positive sure but don't just try to wish it away that doesn't work you need to have a plan alright and just kind of going on that this is where we are a really simple graph I really like this this is our ace currently 
We've had these little bumps because of the different activity that we've had, including Hurricane Dawn. That's the observed ACE, accumulated cyclone energy. Then the climatological line is right here. And as you can see, we are slightly above, but we're getting ready to basically meet it in the next few days. But then look at what climatology does. It skyrockets that ACE based on many, many years of activity. Of course, this goes back 30. But if you look back even to the 1850s, the general idea, we know this, late August into September, that is when a bulk of the activity happens, and it is just a matter of time, especially in a season like this, where the Atlantic is very warm compared to average, and it is just a matter of mixing out the dry air and changing the overall pattern. I think that that's going to change, and it makes sense logically, we look at Africa, lots of rising motion. How do we know that? Well, just look, these huge clusters of thunderstorms, tropical waves over Africa, more over here, and all of these are going to get lined up out into the Atlantic eventually. The air mass will change out here, become more moist in the mid-levels. We will lift the overall subtropical high a little bit farther to the north, and that will kind of let off the gas, as they say, meaning that the trades will slow down just a little bit, will kind of allow the pressures to drop a little bit more, more moisture to become more prevalent in the mid-levels, reduce the dry air injections off of Africa. That will happen farther to the north, not down in the deep tropics. And then that window will open. If it's right at August 20th, plus or minus a day or two, I don't know. It could be a little bit later. I get this sense in the last several years, especially maybe 10 years, that the season kind of has shifted a little bit. I'd have to do like a really deep dive research project to try to sort of prove that theory. But you know, the end of August, early September, I would expect any season where you have warm water temperatures in the Atlantic like we do now to become very active and stay that way probably through at least mid-October depending on the El Nino. This too, I just, look, I know we've talked about sea surface temperatures a lot but I was absolutely just, I, I keep getting astounded. You know, just when you think you've seen it all, and you say, well, what's the big deal? It's been warm all summer. I've done this a long, long time. You know, we're talking, let's see, I officially started this job in 1995 after I graduated from UNC Wilmington. Been looking at stuff like this since the late 90s when internet really became easy to access. And from then on, maybe the early 2000s until now, so let's just call it 20 years. We'll round it down. We'll even be conservative here. In 20 years, I have never seen 32 Celsius out in this part of the Gulf of Mexico outside of a small warm eddy. Those are a little oceanographic term, a little eddy, a little area uh, of 32 Celsius. Yes, those ha happen from time to time. This is ridiculous. Huge area of 32 Celsius. The rest of the Gulf primarily 31. I've never seen it that warm. This is very problematic if we get a hurricane or a, or a tropical storm even that finds the environment favorable for even 48 hours. It could come down to a two-day window. Think about Laura back just three years ago now, this coming late August. It had about a three-day window where it really took off and the effects from that hurricane in southwest Louisiana are nightmarish. They really are. Ian last year really took advantage that last day after coming off the western tip of Cuba before coming up into southwest Florida. Michael, about an 18-hour window. We don't need two weeks of favorability and a big Madden-Julian oscillation. It's just these pockets. Andrew, 1992, that's before this warm era of the Atlantic, of course, but that's an example. And there are others back in history. One of the most infamous, the Labor Day hurricane of 1935, a tropical storm over here in the Bahamas, and then a Category 5 coming through the Keys very shortly thereafter. I think it was less than 36 hours or something like that. My good friend Greg Nordstrom probably could recite it right off the top of his head. Very, very warm water temperatures. The stage is set and we're still warming. We haven't reached the climatological maximum yet. That's concerning as well. All right, anomalies. I mean, seriously, let's show, I want, this is important. This is back on the 9th of July. 
And there was our El Nino. Uh, there's that cold uh, PDO or Pacific Mary O'Donnell mode, whatever you want to call it, cold tongue. That's been there. And then there is the very, very warm Atlantic that we have heard all about over and over and over. And this is what it all looks like today. The Atlantic just basically got warmer over the last month. And I was like, that just can't be. But it has, and it has expanded. The positive anomalies have expanded. You can see it just as well as I can. I certainly didn't manipulate this. There's no, there's no reason to do that. This is enough right here to just say, my goodness, what is going on out there? And this correlation here is the classic look for a very busy Atlantic hurricane season. And look at the Gulf of Mexico. All of the Gulf is at least a degree Celsius, a lot of it 2 and some of it 3 Celsius. We're talking 3, 4, 5 Fahrenheit, warmer than the long-term average. And the El Nino has strengthened some from a month ago. You know, maybe gotten a little thicker, if you will, um, on the latitude side of things. You know, there's more of it north and south, right? But it's not really expanded west, and we lost just a little bit of these really darker, and I'm nitpicking here, but the 4 to 5 Celsius kind of got chiseled away just ever so slightly, but there's just a larger area here of, of like 2 to 3 Celsius. Regardless, the El Nino is there. But let me leave you with this thought, and I talked about this, I don't know, months ago when the first UK Met office forecast came out, and in their discussion of it, they mentioned this uh, ONI, the Oceanic Nino Index. So I don't lose you in the weeds here. Just different ways of measuring how the El Nino is doing compared to everything else. And uh, it's a scientific way to look at El Nino or the Oceanic Index of what the ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, is doing. And we know that El Nino typically causes wind shear in the Atlantic. The UK Met folks were kind of speculating uh, scientifically, which is perfectly okay to do, almost like a hypothesis, that there's also, and there is controversy here, some people don't believe this is a thing, but I think it's worth mentioning, sort of an ROI, a relative oceanic Nino index. In other words, when all of the basins are warmer and you have El Nino, does it really have the same impact? Whereas if the Atlantic were just where it should be, if everything on that map in the Atlantic were like the base color right here, and we had this El Nino, we'd be probably looking at, hey, the hurricane season's done. We'll probably have a couple out in the middle of the Atlantic, and that's it. Something kind of like the 80s. 83, I think, had, what, four name storms that year or something like that? Um, that wouldn't shock me at all. But the Atlantic is way above normal on a huge scale, all of it. So the El Nino just might not have the same impacts. Here's what's really interesting, and this is what I'm going to end it on. In science, for people that say, I don't know, I give them the most credit. Because that sh shows that we're not full of hubris, right? That we know everything. We can conquer math and science and nature. <laughs> you're, you're very wrong about that if you think that. I don't know what will happen, and neither do a lot of these prominent scientists. Dr. Klotzbach, and they use a word here, instead of just flat out saying, I don't know, they do use this word that to me is equivalent, and that is a lot of uncertainty. And I believe that that truthfulness is very helpful in the grander scheme of things, because it shows that we are dealing with something that is outside of the bounds of what we've seen before, and we have a lot to learn as things go on. All right, so we don't know how this will affect everything else coming from here on, but most of the chips are on the fact that the Atlantic Basin will become active and it could get very ugly for several weeks. And with that, we'll get this online for you. And it's like, come on, Mark, you gotta leave us with some good news. The good news, as I keep saying, is there's something we can do about it. We're not helpless. We can prepare to the best of our individual needs and situations and use the science to our advantage, even when we don't know. All right? So there you go. Told you it's going to be an interesting update. Hopefully you'll agree. And um, we'll do it again tomorrow. All right? I am Mark Sedeth. I don't know if it's going to be as interesting tomorrow. We shall see. Part of that's up to the tropics. I'm Mark Sedeth, Hurricane Track. As always, thanks for tuning in to me. 
I'll talk to you again tomorrow.